The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. We look at stories from business leaders who've dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they picked themselves back up, and how they help workplaces can change in the future. Today, we're going to look deeper at the issue of substance abuse and anxiety through the lens of an exceptionally high-functioning addict and the underlying issues that lead to those addictions. Imagine being in one of the most stressful times of your career or your education, working long hours, your personal life is non-existent, you might not be sleeping, you're not eating well, and to take the edge off, you have a drink and then a few more, or a friend offers you an Adderall pill. You take it and all of a sudden, the work just happens and you're so focused. Or maybe you completely separate your working professional self from that other self. Dependence on alcohol or other drugs is common in the public at large. One of every eight adults struggles with both alcohol and drug use disorder simultaneously. Mental health disorders and substance use disorders are quite often co-occurring. And in 2017, there were 8.5 million American adults who had both. Addicts are people like us, people who are high functioning, who succeed in business, who become leaders. Substance abuse and misuse and addiction are a mental struggle in and of themselves, of course, and they often mask other issues like anxiety and depression. So later in the show, we'll hear from Dr. Zev Shulman Olivier, an addiction psychiatrist who focuses on meditation, self-compassion, and awareness as a way to find a light at the end of the substance abuse tunnel. First, a firsthand experience. My guest is Seth Manukin. He's a longtime journalist who struggled with addiction, and now he works in the Comparative Media Studies Department at MIT. And you may wonder, how did someone who teaches at an esteemed education institution, who's a best-selling journalist, who got in early to Harvard, hit rock bottom? So I want to start off by going back deep into the days of your addiction so we can paint the picture for our audience um, so they understand how serious a disease uh, this was for you. Is there a sort of rock bottom moment that you can recall for us? Um, yeah, for sure. I started using drugs and really doing what I think now is pretty clear was self-medicating early on in high school. And right from day one, from the first time I got high, I never treated it as something that I would do to sort of party or to have a good time. I just wanted to be high all the time. Rock bottom for me came um, after college. I moved to New York City to start my career as a journalist and began using heroin almost as soon as I moved. So the first time I used heroin was on a Sunday morning by myself, and that was the pattern that pretty much played out. I, I would use um, every day, almost always by myself, became physically addicted very quickly, um, the heroin was the first time that I was unable to kind of make it seem to the outside world that everything was mm. fine and dandy. Um, you know, I, I was nodding off. I lost my job. And after about a year uh, of being there, I was living alone in my room, would signal down to the street for a dealer uh, and have them come up. I basically didn't leave my room and was eating like a combination of cranberry juice and, and M&Ms. And I moved back uh, to Boston where I'd grown up with the intention of, of quitting heroin. Um, and instead, I started uh, injecting it. And uh, over the next two years, it was really just a, a series of sort of doing things that I swore I would never do. I ran out of money often 
Um, and there was a period where I would test drugs for a dealer so he could figure out what purity they were. I ended up with my injecting a lot of PCP uh, one night and in the middle of the winter in Boston, being naked on the street and fighting off policemen um, and ended up strapped to a gurney in the hospital. And my parents were called and told that if they if they wanted to essentially say goodbye, they should come by soon because the doctors did not think or were not confident I was going to make it through the night. Um, the next morning, checked myself out of the hospital, didn't even go home, just went right back to the dealer's house and um, said, you really owe me now. <laughs> um, I kept on using for about 10 months after that. Um, another thing I should say is that during that last year, I, I think I was in 10 different inpatient facilities. Um, what I would do essentially is when I ran out of money or ran out of drugs, I would check myself in someplace because they would not try and, you know, bring you from 60 to zero right away. They would wean you off of opiates. And so I would stay there for a couple of days and essentially get a couple of days of opiates and then check myself out and try and figure out how I was going to score again. I was just going to look back and say, when you when you first started using heroin, Sunday morning, I, I was thinking of that song, Sunday Morning Coming Down by Chris Christopherson. Um, what job did you have and how soon did you get fired? I was uh, the managing editor of a children's entertainment magazine, um, like young, you know, oh. like, like, I think five to 10, basically. And I kept that job much longer than I should have been able to because I was having a relationship with the editor in chief. Um, <laughs> my my boundaries were not great at the time. Uh, I don't remember exactly what the final precipitating incident was, but I mean, this was in 1995. Um, the magazine was part of Time Warner's sort of first internet portal. I think there were 10 different magazines that were part of their first internet portal. It was called Pathfinder. And like there was a day when we were meeting with advertisers to sort of pitch ourselves. And we were all waiting outside the elevator banks and the elevator opened up and I just vomited everywhere. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> um, I mean, it, it must have looked like it was a horror movie or something. I mean, you know, the here here are these uh, th these advertising executives about to step off the the elevator. The whole staff of the magazine is assembled in front of them, and I just let loose. Uh, so by the time that I was eventually fired, I, I was essentially not functioning on any level. I I wasn't showing up to work anymore. Do you looking back? I mean, you started using drugs when you were very young. What were you seeking and what did that first instance give you that you lacked before in terms of your performance and your ability to function in school? I mean, one of the one of the things that's interesting for this about me is that I write about science and one of the things that I write about is sort of cognitive tricks and, and cognitive preconceptions. And so it's it's always difficult for me to tell when I talk about that, you know, my past going back decades, if I'm talking about a narrative that I have placed over my behavior, or if that was what I was actually feeling at the time. Uh, but what I do know, the, the, the first time I got high was one morning, um, and I was a freshman in high school. And I was in high school, I there were, you know, different cliques. If, if it was the Breakfast Club, I would have been in the Judd Nelson sort of uh, arty, punky, ultimately druggy um, mm. group. I, I, was, I bleached my hair. I rode a skateboard, whatever. But you got straight A's, correct? I mean, that's part of the, the sort of mythology in the, around you, too. Yeah. I, I, I did well all through high school. Yeah. But the first time I used was just that there were some older girls. There were, I think they were juniors and I was a freshman and they just asked me if I wanted to get high before school. Uh, and, you know, I definitely did if there were older junior girls that were inviting me. Um, and it, it, I don't know exactly what I felt at the time. What I do know is that I had been dealing with 
uh, obsessive compulsive behavior and sort of an anxiety disorder or behavior that would seem to be attributed to an anxiety disorder uh, since I had been very young. Um, mm. I had had trouble sleeping since I was eight or nine. Um, and when I started using every day, that was the first time since then that like I found it easier to go to sleep. I think what it you know ultimately did was just quieted down the kind of drumbeat of anxiety to the point where it actually was easier for me to function. That was something that people who knew me would comment on all the time, that they were amazed at what I could do while I was high. Um, and looking back, I think it's almost more like being high. And, and this, I should clarify that at this point, this was... I was sort of a, a garbage head and would do anything, but mostly what I was doing was smoking pot. And it sort of leveled me out. When you got to Harvard, you know, and, and I know it was different in the in the 80s and early 90s, but, you know, it seems to me you get to Harvard and a lot of the kids at Harvard are like, I'm going places, right? Like, I've got my life mapped out. I'm going to be successful. This is my ladder. Did you have that ladder? Did you have that plan for your life? Or was your drug addiction just everything well it wasn't it wasn't even that my drug addiction was everything it was just i hated those people <laughs> you know there was no i i did not have my ma life all mapped out i didn't even have my you know I, I i switched majors like six or seven times i gravitated towards the misfits and the kids who um would have been the Judd Nelson's from Breakfast Club in all of their schools, and now we were all together. Um, it, as crazy as it sounds, we had a in our freshman dining hall. There was a smoking room, which uh, really boggles my mind. But anyway, there was a smoking room, and um, I was a smoker. But um, the smoking room also was a sort of way for the people who you know, were not mapping out their career to the Senate or were not preparing for law school or whatever the case may be, would would all would all gravitate and get together. So, you know, I, I, that that was the group of people that I felt allied with from right off the bat. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life, a promise that pays off. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. You know, you're a writer, and I would imagine that as a writer, you observe a lot and you think a lot. Looking back, how much has your writing helped you understand the condition of someone with substance abuse, you know, and, and how you might use that to self-medicate? So that's a, it's, it's something I've thought about, and it's a really interesting question. I, until a couple of years ago, I never kept a journal, which seems weird to to me and um almost seems like an unconsciously deliberate way to avoid kind of looking at things too deeply um or looking at things about my own life too deeply i had a sort of um mythology of the type of writer that i was going to be um and that i admired you know i was a huge fan of hunter thompson <laughs> How could I guess? <laughs> right. Uh, and then actually ended up becoming friends with him. Wow. You know, I mean, not best friends, but friends to the point where, like, he would call me at three o'clock in the morning and uh, say, like, Seth, you're not doing anything weird, are you? And <laughs> I would have to explain to him that, you know, no, I, I was working at Newsweek at the time. He was the person who was going to be doing something weird at three in the morning. So, you know, I had this sort of outlaw image of myself that was not actually reflective of reality in, in, in any way. Um, but so I kind of built my drug use into that. 
um, and for whatever reason, you know, did not really look at it in a kind of serious and sustained way. And 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 don't think I really did until a couple of years after being sober. Um, and even then, it wasn't so much I, I wasn't so much analyzing it as I was trying to understand it on an emotional level. And how do, and, and I'm sorry, how do you understand? I mean, now it's it's been decades. How do you understand it on an emotional level, and what's its relationship to your your anxiety, your sort of internal anxiety as a person? It's definitely not coincidental that the drugs that I gravitated towards were downers, mm. were things that one could use to alleviate anxiety. I think that as I have come to grips with the levels of anxiety I feel on a daily basis, it's pretty apparent to me that a big role that drugs were playing in my life was um, kind of in lieu of dealing with an anxiety disorder in a, in a way that was more appropriate or, or healthier. Hmm. What is the role that anxiety plays in your life? Um, and, and how do you, how do you co- cope with it and deal with it as a sober person? It is, you know, I, I, I have an anxiety disorder. There's, I think, um, uh, again, that sort of goes against the image that I had of myself as someone who could stay up until five in the morning and then drive six hours to meet a source and then write a, 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 a magazine feature in, in two hours. But, you know, the, the reality is that anxiety affects me in sort of big ways and, and small ways. Um, now, there are a whole bunch of different tools I have. Um, I have been in therapy, I guess, for probably 15 or 16 years I am on medication. Um, I have a meditation practice. And it's just something that I, you know, being aware of having an anxiety disorder also means that I'm aware of things that are going to make me anxious. And being aware of them allows me to kind of deal with them in a, in a healthier way. I mean, you know, for instance, right now with COVID-19, um, I at my parents are in their 70s. Um, you know, I have two kids, one of whom has asthma. And I have been able to not only realize intellectually, but I think really internalize that for me, letting myself get really worked up about this would be more harmful than the actual threat of the virus at this point. But, you know, for the most part, being aware of when my anxiety is going to be activated um, and then sort of instead of so the 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 bad version of my anxiety monster is I start thinking about COVID-19 and that starts rolling downhill and I decide that everyone in the world is going to die or it's going to be like the 1918 Spanish flu and 500 million people are going to die or whatever the case is. Um, and I sort of become paralyzed. But the because I'm aware that that is one sort of through line that I can start to um, that I can I can seize hold of. And then once I do, it takes control of me. I can also before that happens, kind of understand a narrative that's going to be more healthy for me that also is probably more true to real life. You know, it's funny because I think a lot of what you're talking about is is very mature and is is also part of a product of maturity, you know, as we get older when we're able to reason with ourselves. You talked about wanting to be a writer like a Hunter Thompson or a William S. Burroughs and sort of re- really living on the edge and creating art that was that was, you know, wrought from pain and and you're not that kind of writer. You're an incredibly successful writer. How do you think of success and your own success perhaps differently given what you've been through? And, and, and does your success feel good to you now? 
It's a tough question. I mean, it depends on the extent to which I'm feeling imposter syndrome at any given moment. But, you know, I mean, one of, one of the effects of, of using drugs almost daily from 14 to 25 with that little two-year interregnum there is that the emotional maturing that takes place, um, I, I missed a lot of that. And so I find that I still have to sort of be aware of when I have more of a teenage kind of view of the world. Um, it was something I had to work on a lot to enable me to have a, a healthy relationship and, and get married. And um, But one of the things that I've had to sort of come to grips with as an adult that I think most people come to grips with as a teenager is that um, I'm not as great as I thought I was. You know, the the reason why I'm not Hunter Thompson or William S. Burroughs is not because they did more drugs for longer than me. It's because they're better writers than I am. Um, and they were incredibly talented in ways that were unique. In the case of Hunter, he also just worked incredibly hard. Um, you know, he was someone who used to type out uh, Hemingway's novels so he could get a visceral feel for the language. Wow. And it's something that he he very much nurtured, um, but he has this reputation as someone who just, you know, would kind of come down and spit out brilliance. Right. We don't like our bad boys to work hard. We want them to sort of, you know, be, go out in a flame of glory and just be hit with, you know, creative genius. We We don't like to think about the work. Right. Exactly. So for me, you know, part of my dealing with my own professional life has been accepting and realizing that I am a fine writer. I have, there are some things that I think I'm good at and I'm able to do. And that has allowed me to write books and, and, and write articles and, and have a lot of really interesting experiences, but, you know, being more realistic about my own talents has also allowed me to feel much more grateful about the success that I do have. There are a lot of people who are better writers than I am who have not had the opportunity to write a book. There are a lot of people who are better reporters um, who've not had the opportunities that that I've had. So, um, you know, part of the maturing process for me has been being able to see myself more realistically and being able to be grateful for the opportunities I've been given and the ways that I've been able to take advantage of those opportunities um, instead of what I think is kind of my default, um, which is why am I not someplace different than I am right now? If my book got reviewed well, why wasn't it a number one bestseller? Or if it was on the bestseller list, why was it only number eight and not number one? Or why did it sell X number of copies instead of 10X number of copies? And so, you know, that, that has been, that's been something that's been important to me and has allowed me to be more content with my life. And also it's allowed me to kind of make sure that I'm structuring my life in a way that allows me to be content. I, I still have a hard time with that. I think probably I'm miserable about work-related things, whether it's my teaching job or my writing job, then I am not. But it's something that I'm aware of and I'm working towards, and that is that has helped me. Whether you're going through a struggle with substance misuse or abuse yourself, or a colleague might be struggling, it's helpful to have a bigger picture to focus on and look critically at how you think about addiction. I loved what Dr. Peter Grinspoon had to say. Now, Grinspoon himself was a well-regarded doctor who had a severe opiate addiction. He wrote, A good first step towards successfully supporting a person in recovery is to honestly examine your own beliefs and feelings about addiction and to make sure your response to the colleague you're about to welcome back isn't hampered by any hidden negative attitudes. Which brings me to our next guest, addiction psychiatrist Dr. Zev Shulman Olivier, We'll hear more about his approach to addiction that involves meditation, self-compassion, and awareness techniques.
What I wanted to ask is, you know, how often in your experience have you seen high performing individuals who struggle with substance addiction? You know, there's there's such a common trope in our society that people who are um, addicted to a substance that's bad for them are living a life that is outwardly falling apart. Addiction is widely prevalent. Substance use is incredibly common. Many people are using substances or involved in addictive behaviors in ways that others are not aware of. And while it is true that when people start to dedicate more and more of their time to addictive behaviors or substance use, that often that can impact the work they do in their professional life and, and can lead to um, losses and, you know, like quote unquote, hitting rock bottom. Um, many people do manage to actually hide their behavior for a long period of time. And in fact, those um, who are uh, people of means or who have had careers that allow them to have disposable income can um, and often do uh, maintain habits for longer periods of time because they can afford to uh, mm. in ways that end up probably impacting their overall well-being and, and their productivity and their mental health, um, as well as probably the way they are perceived by their colleagues uh, and the way that they're able to work on teams. When you're, when you're working with an addict or someone who's sort of turned the corner and, and is in treatment, do you find that the people in their lives will then say, gosh, you know, they were showing all these signs or I should have known? Is there a lot of sort of re retrospective knowing if someone has managed to sort of pass for so, for so long? So I should say that, that in my primary work, I work with individuals who have had substance use disorders or have, have been using substances in ways that have been unhealthy for them. And most people don't show up to come see an addiction psychiatrist like me without having had something negative happen around their substance use that has caused them to realize that they need some kind of support or help. That might be around a change in in their economic status or their business is not doing as well and the the five to ten thousand dollars a month they were spending on oxycodone or on cocaine um, they, they no longer can afford it and are looking for a way out um, where they haven't really had any consequences per se but they just start to realize that they can't financially afford this anymore i've worked with a fair number of, of people who have been entrepreneurs and i think that that the entrepreneurial spirit um, is one of taking risks and uh, one uh, that often leads to a lot of ups and downs and also uh, a lot of dysregulation as far as late nights, a lot of things that make it hard to kind of maintain a steady schedule, which can be important for recovery. I just say experientially as a, or clinically as a provider, entrepreneurs often don't have they often seem to see themselves as as uh, individuals who may not have to necessarily follow all the social rules that you would expect in a larger, you know, larger standard company. And so with that has greater flexibility, but, you know, unstable work hours and um, and a lot of a sense of self invested in the potential for success in the work that they're doing. There's, there's, there's interesting work right now in the advertising industry along that line because creatives, right? You, you know, if you're creative, you can work in a huge corporate ad agency, but you get away with a lot of BS. And there are similar patterns. And, and you think of that, right? You can think of the sort of genius creative who might be staying up all night fueled on whatever, but they produce beautiful work and no one cares. I think that there are also certain professions that lend themselves and our and our, our society has created this kind of iconoclast imagery of them that, that can fuel bad behavior and addiction. Well, I do think that for some people, the substances fuel their creativity and also fuel their energy. 
Um, we see more, I think, especially among in the new generations, the millennial workforce, um, that uh, use of uh, stimulants is much more common um, than I think it, 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 at least it was 20 years ago for new employees coming into, into the workplace. Uh, stimulant use has been widespread in colleges now for probably the past decade as a way to help people with um, test performance or to kind of get that paper done. Um, and so I see a lot of young adults who are entering the professional workforce and, you know, that still are relying on stimulants in some way to help them to have that edge uh, or, or to kind of keep up the energy that they need to keep up with uh, um, the intense, intense career that they've chosen. Uh, you know, at, at the heart of a lot of this is um, people really yearning or wanting something more than what they have. Uh, and that fuels a lot of um, people's professional aspirations is to kind of get to some new stage or to somehow be accepted or seen as someone more than than um, what that nagging voice inside of you thinks that you might actually be. Um, <laughs> and in doing so, um, people will turn to substances often when they feel like they're, they're worried that people might find out just just how incompetent they are or just how normal they might actually be. I think this is actually where, you know, approaches like mindfulness and self-compassion based approaches can really help because um, when we can start to accept ourselves for who we are and what we have to offer and realize that we do have value to society, even if we're not the best of this or the best of that, and that we are lovable even and, and, you know, welcomed inside the social circle of normal people as one of the people I've worked with before said, you know, that, that, that we are, that we do have a place um, in that, even if we're not using substances, it can actually uh, take away one of the things that really fuels substance use for a lot of people. I'm curious if you think that a moment like this, where we are all so vulnerable and we are all so open about being vulnerable can also be a moment for someone who maybe, you know, has been sober, but is nervous to say, hey, team, you know, while we're sharing, I'm going to tell you this. And if that's okay, if it, it can be like a helpful window opening right now. You know, I sure hope so. I, yeah. I try to never give um, explicit advice around this to my patients about whether or not they should kind of tell or not. I, I really... I really kind of have to trust people to see if they're in the place where basically to follow their intuition around, around this, um, partly because the stigma around addiction has been so strong for so many years. And even though it is, you know, similar in many ways to, to many other chronic illnesses, uh, that we rapidly account for and uh, express support for in workplaces. I have seen that some workplaces end up being very supportive um, and others consistently are not. So I, I, I wouldn't just kind of come out and say, yes, every, everyone, now is the time because of COVID-19 <laughs> to, to forget about that. Um, but, I, but I would say that I do think that those people who do manage to do that and do feel like they can get the support of their colleagues do end up being seeming more resilient often in the face of stress. I, I'd also say that you may not need people in your workplace to know that specific, this specific aspect, but it is good to let them know that, that you're going through something. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, for many of many patients, when I feel like they've often have talked about it as depression or anxiety, because um, that's one of the things that's fueling their addiction. And that at least has been helpful to be able to ask for help. Because one of the things that sometimes is hardest for people with addiction as well is that is that addiction is in many ways a, or, or one way of understanding addiction is that it's a, it's a uh, desperate search for control that as things start to feel uncontrollable, um, whether it's your emotions are uncontrollable, whether it's um, body sensations and bodily processes that become uncontrollable, or it's the external life 
the economy that's uncontrollable or or your social situation that's uncontrollable, people often will start to turn to something that gives them a reliable feeling of feeling okay or feeling good. And nothing is more reliable, at least in the short term, for helping you feel good than substances. And often the more reliable it is, the faster the the faster the onset of, of euphoria with a drug, the often the more addictive it's considered to be because of the reliability and the way it helps people kind of regain control in a moment where they're feeling out of control. It sounds so incredibly logical. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. But unfortunately, what happens is um, whenever we try to get control in uncontrollable circumstances, whenever we try to get certainty when there is, in fact, uncertainty, whenever we try to stop things from changing, when, in fact, everything is changing, we generally just set ourselves up for a bigger fall later and um, for more uncertainty, for more change, and for less, ultimately less control. And, and that's, that's what happens to a lot of people with substances is that they get caught in that um, cycle then of searching out for those those things. Um, part of mindfulness, I think, is starting to really recognize the just the ubiquity of uncertainty, the ubiquity <laughs> of our lack of control over things changing. And to the extent that we can turn towards that, welcome in uncertainty and change, or relate to it differently um, with less fear and more acceptance and warmth, um, almost like treating this like an old friend that we're seeing again, the less scary it becomes and the less we start to panic in response to those moments. Um, and actually... That it, feels it, so much less logical to me, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> um, uh, can you say more about what, what you mean by that? Well, you know, it's it's funny. I mean, one of the things... I've talked to several Buddhists on the show and, you know, it's very much about observing and getting unattached, right? And letting the uncomfortable feelings come and not feeling the need to sort of attack them like you want your body to attack a virus. Um, and that doesn't feel logical to me, but taking a pill to make the pain go away feels inherently logical. Hmm. So we have a choice. This is an addiction science piece. So the brain is constantly making predictions about the way that the body needs to change or things we need to do in order to make the next moment be as we want it to be. Often though, the next moment is not exactly how we want it to be. And so our brain um, is constantly from every in every moment kind of creating these what's called predictive errors. So it's it's noticing that things are just a little bit off from where they're supposed to like be. Like what? Can you give us just a silly practical example? Yeah. So um, maybe my my throat maybe is hurting a little bit. And so I, um, it's a little bit different than I think it ought to be. Um, so I, I then have an urge to want to drink some water to be able to smooth out my throat. So um, it's called active inference. So I'm, I'm now doing something active to be able to bring my perceived state to where I think it should be. Mm -hmm. And so there's a concept that's arising more recently called perceptual inference, which instead of actively trying to bring your current state to where you think it should be, you bring what, what, what your should be state is to what you're actually perceiving right now. And so it's a way of getting around this neurobiological circuit that essentially is constantly evaluating everything and deciding if it is how it should be. And, and, and it's this tendency to, for like, for evaluative feedback that our brain is constantly doing that helps us to kind of shift our behavior over time as we try to reduce discrepancy between how we think we should be and, and what, what we're actually experiencing. But it also leaves us constantly feeling dissatisfied. Because, because even when you, even when you win that, you know, you, you place that, you know, that, that trade and you, you know, you, you, you have a big, big win, a million dollars come in or a billion dollars or who knows what that is, or you get that big deal, or you finally get that recognition you're waiting for from your boss the next day, or even the next hour, even the next minute, you start, you feel the same way again. You feel a little bit dissatisfied. These positive, pleasant feelings don't last. And 
And then we're back to this feeling of generally feeling a little dissatisfied. And so part, and, and that the, that's the basic nature of the brain. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned that this is what Buddhists talk about, because I think this is, this is what, um, the idea of dukkha in Buddhism, um, is this kind of general this sense of dissatisfaction. So it's this sense that, that, and I think it's really based on this brain mechanism that, that we're constantly kind of reassessing and evaluating and realizing that things could be a little bit different because things are always changing. Why, why did our brain, why, why, what evolutionary function does this fulfill? If, if it sounds to me like our brains are always setting us up to either try to fill a hole with something or always seek more, more, more. I think you've described it almost as like keeping a buzz going, right? Yeah. What, what purpose did this serve? So, um, this is one of the major ways that animals, um, and organisms, um, learn and change behavior. You know, it gets hardwired into what's called the reward system of the brain. And, and so we're constantly evaluating both our needs externally, um, and, and, and around what behaviors we should be doing as well as just internally the, um, the state of our body um, and, and our bodily needs are constantly being assessed and, and our body is constantly responding often unconsciously um, to, to various different uh, needs, thirst, hunger, pain, itch, tickle, temperature. When you start to actually start to pay attention to these things and bring your awareness to these, um, these stimuli and these sensations, what you can start to see is the way that they're they're driving behavior, driving emotions, driving thoughts. And if you can actually start to do the opposite of bringing the way things should be to way that the way they actually are in this moment, it allows you to kind of almost circumvent this thing that's always happening. And you often are suddenly in a moment of what feels like spaciousness and calm. So like what? Can you can you give us an example? So if we're able to just stop or slow things down and be able to turn towards whatever it is that we're experiencing and just allow whatever it is that's arising to be there, just observing. So this could be anxiety that I'm going to lose my job because the economy is going to have a global crash. Yeah, yeah, it could be that. It could be that. So just observing that that's what's arising for you and noticing what that feels like in the body, noticing what that feels like in the thoughts, noticing if fear is, is there, and just noticing if this is like a pleasant feeling or an unpleasant feeling, or maybe it's a neutral feeling. And just trying to allow that, that unpleasantness just to be there for a moment without kind of reacting to it or trying to get rid of it right away. By just allowing that to be there, accepting that th this is... This is, this is an ache that's here. Um, I don't need to make it go away, just allowing to feel the ache and maybe even um, turning towards myself with some compassion and saying, you know, I'm not the only one out there in the world that is worrying about this. In fact, this is not the only thing people worry about. There's other things people worry about that are even bigger than me losing my job. There are people who don't have food today. Um, you know, just, just getting a sense of the, the sense that this suffering, this, this thing is not being the way we want them to be is, is, is a global phenomenon. It's a, it's, it's common humanity. It's, we all have these moments. This happens to be my moment. Can I be kind to myself right now? But not diminishing the feeling, because sometimes I think that people can feel diminished by that, I'm, depending on how they were brought up, etc. I'm deserving of, of being cared about. And this is a moment when this is hard for me. Can I treat myself kindly like I treat somebody else? Absolutely. This is suffering. This is, this is a big moment of suffering. But it doesn't mean that I need to make it go away. Um, and if we can stay with it, even just for a little bit, and, and, and stay with that unpleasantness, then what happens is we don't then act out um, or act on a behavior, which is ultimately going to kind of maintain that unpleasantness or keep us running from the unpleasantness. And we will be in, in the most clear mindset to be able to actually navigate the coming challenges with as much focus and presence and calm as possible. So that when we kind of start to expand our awareness back out again and kind of open 
to what's really here in front of us, we can do it from a place of actually just a little bit of gratitude that, you know, that we're able to be kind to ourselves, that we're able to find a moment of um, presence and peace within this chaotic change that's going to actually help us um, navigate what's coming up better. If not, maybe we go home, we're worried about work, worried we might lose our job. We come home, we yell at our kids, we tell our wife who made dinner or tell our husband who made dinner that like, I'm not, I don't have time for this right now. And we go up and and sit by the computer and think about the email we're going to send to try to prevent ourselves from getting fired or whatever it might be. Um, I I mean, I would just drink a half a bottle of wine. And then, and and, and then as soon as that's done, we drink, (laughs) we drink a full bottle of wine (laughs) or, or Jack Daniels, you know, and, um, and now everyone's miserable. And, um, and we haven't actually done anything to be able to help ensure our job or to protect or prepare ourselves for whatever the next step is um, that needs to happen. And so the more and more that we avoid what is arising uh, in each moment, the, the actually the farther we get from being able to work with uh, what we have. Um, some things are out of our control. You know, if, if every night we're drinking a bottle of wine very soon we're going to have another problem on our hands which is that we can't stop drinking that bottle of wine and now not only do we not have a job but we also need to find a bottle of wine that we're paying for every night um and and making time to drink so so i think that, and people get caught up but at any point what we can do is we can start to just observe what's arising we can stop we can try to allow it to be there and any effort we do to allow what is arising to be there actually gains us wisdom and gives us the opportunity to be able to, to be more skillful in the next moment for our response. And, and, and over time, that changes people's behavior and their outcomes and, and probably their effectiveness in their workplace. That's it for this week's show. If you like what you've heard, tell a friend or rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have a question or a topic that you'd like to see featured on the show, you can email anxiousachiever at gmail.com or tweet me at Mora A.M. That's M-O-R-R-A-A-M. Many thanks to Mary Dew, my amazing producer and the team at Harvard Business Review. And of course, to our advertisers who keep us going and my guests. And if you like the Anxious Achiever music, it's by Brian Campbell at Signal Sounds NYC. From HBR Presents, this is The Anxious Achiever, and I'm Maura Aarons-Mealy.